Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm looking forward to presenting this information. Um, like Anissa said, I am from Ho'olanapua and I am um, just really um, passionate about this topic because it's just one that everybody, especially if you're a caregiver or a parent or work with kids, um, should be more informed about. Um, and uh, like she said as well, we're committed to the prevention of sex trafficking and providing care for children who have been exploited. So our mission is really to educate and bring awareness to the community about sex trafficking, as well as um, we even have direct service programs that work with um, at-risk, vulnerable, and exploited youth as well. So I'll just go ahead and get started. So just really quickly, we have a couple of guidelines for our time together today. Um, first, please respect yourself entirely. And what that means is this information might be heavy at times or overwhelming. So if at any time you feel, um, you know, just an uneasy even, or just um, overwhelmed by it, please, you know, feel free to do what you need to do to take care of you. If that's just get a drink of water, cut off your camera, you know, take some deep breaths um, so that you feel comfortable um, with this information as best as possible. Um, also respect the people around you and just make sure that we are making this a safe space for everyone um, because we just don't know everyone's background or everyone's story. So we always wanna make sure that we're, um, we're honoring people's um, stories and um, respecting people's time. And then lastly, just consider the people in your life. This information, maybe it's not um, re relatable to you right now, but it could be in a few years, it could be um, you know something that comes um, that you that you feel is necessary for a future relationship or a coworker or um, a grandchild or somebody like that in the future. So it's just good to remember that the information will be important, whether or not you necessarily need to use it this right now at this very moment. All right, so we're just going to go ahead and get into it. So we're going to do this fun little interactive part. And really, this is totally up to you how if you want to respond or not. Um, but it's called Name That App. And it's just kind of to get us into the social media conversation. Um, so I'm going to put up different apps on each slide. And if you feel comfortable, you can totally unmute yourself and just tell me the name of the app if you know it. Um, you could also write it in the chat, but that might take a little bit longer to to access, so this maybe just unmuting would be the best option. All right, so we're gonna go ahead. I'm sure everybody Facebook. knows what this one is. Yep, Facebook. Twitter. Yep. Instagram. Snapchat. Snapchat. Yep. TikTok. TikTok. Right. Yeah. I'm proud. Yeah, this one's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Reddit. Reddit, good. Yeah, that one. Not, not everybody knows that one. YouTube. YouTube. Mm -hmm. Zoom. Zoom, yes. Cash App. Yeah, Cash App. Venmo. Mm -hmm. Google Pay. Yeah, Google Pay. Yeah, that one I didn't even know until just recently, actually. What's that? Mm -hmm. Facebook, Facebook Messenger. Messenger. Right. Pinterest. Yep. Yeah. PayPal? Pandora. Uh, Pan yeah, Pandora. Mm -hmm. Oh, Pandora. Mm -hmm. Spotify. Spotify. I love Spotify, actually. <laughs> Yeah, this one's Twitch? a tricky one. What was that? Is it Twitch? No, close. Similar. It's actually called Discord. And it's also um, kind of like a messaging app. You could also do um, video gaming and things like that as well. So this Twitch. one is Twitch. Mm -hmm. This one is Twitch, yeah. Duolingo. Duolingo. Uh -huh. Hey, space. It is. And if you can believe it, it's actually still out there. There's still MySpace. I, I did not realize that it was still a thing. You know, I remember getting my first MySpace account when I was like 
23, <laughs> a long time ago. And I thought that it was uh, over and done with, but apparently it's a, more like a pop culture place right now where people share music and entertainment news and things like that. But there is still a discussion board on there and chatting, I think as well. So we did that to kind of open the, the door for the conversation about different kinds of apps. Um, because maybe, you know, as a parent or as a caregiver, you don't know exactly all the ones that are out there. We only covered a few. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to dive into a little bit more. Um, so this is a, you know, a graphic that talks about nine apps that parents should know about. And this was actually um, presented or made by the Sarasota Police Department in May of 2019 um, because there was a recent bust from the Sarasota Police Department um, where they arrested 21 men in a six day sting called Operation Intercept Five. And in this um, arrest, the, the men were accused of soliciting young boys and girls for sex. And many times they were using social media to solicit. And so because of that bust, these policemen thought that these were apps that parents should know about in, ref in reference to that. So some of these on here you guys are familiar with, like we talked about Snapchat. Um, the one on here, or kick even, that's pretty popular. The one on here that a lot of people don't know about is this calculator app at the bottom. It's actually not a calculator. Um, the difference you can tell is that it has that percentage sign at the end. And that is because um, that's kind of the, how you can see that it's different than the regular calculator app. And it, so it's a secret app where you can actually hide things like files, um, videos, your browser history, even um, photos and things like that. So that's something just to be aware of. Um, and then of course, some of these on here are dating apps like Bumble um, and even uh, I think Whisper also. So these are just the apps that were listed in that first, first um, article. Well then two months later, the same police department from the same bust decided they should add some more apps to this list given what they were discovering through this bust. So the top two lines are the, the rest of the apps that they added. So there's Meet Me and Grindr, Scout, which is like a location-based dating app, and um, TikTok, which we've discussed already, which a lot of kids are into these days, um, WhatsApp, and then Badoo, which is um, where you can share videos and photos. It's like a sharing kind of app. So they thought that they would increase this list well, then just two months later, again, based on this bus, they added more apps. So now there's 21 that they wanted um, parents to be aware of. And um, so you've got, again, some dating apps like Plenty of Fish. Um, let's see. Moco Space is also a dating app. Um, Best Secret Folder is another place where you can hide photos and videos. Um, it even has password protection. And Zeus is, Zeus is a dating app as well. It's also based on location. And that's because they want to match people up within the vicinity of where they live. Um, but that can be dangerous, obviously, if a teenager or child is, is getting on there. And then Monkey is a live video chat app. So this is the list, the completed list of 21 apps that they felt like parents should know about. So it's just, and, and this is just 21. There are, we're going to talk in a few minutes about how many apps there actually are. Um, but these are the ones that are the most uh, prevalent, prevalent and used most often when it comes to, um, you know, sexually related crimes against children. So who wants to take a guess, since I was talking about how many apps there are, about how many apps there are on Google Play? Hundreds? I'm sorry, what was that? Over a hundred. I say no, three, 3,000. Okay, we got a hundred, we've got 3,000, anybody else? Okay, the number is probably gonna shock you guys. There are 2.6 million apps. Whoa. Yeah, on Google Play, it's crazy. What about Apple? There's 3.6 million apps on Apple. So, as you can see, there's a lot out there that is vying for our kids' attention. And that list that the police department put out was just 21. So that's not to mention all the other apps that are available for our children to access. 
<clears throat> okay, so this is a list of the most popular apps um, by the number of active users since January 2021. And so on here, you can see that Facebook has over two and a half million active users as of January of last year. YouTube is number two, and then WhatsApp, We've got Facebook Messenger and Instagram. So those, those are the top five uh, most popular apps. Just a couple down though, there's TikTok and Snapchat. So um, it's just good to know what the main you know, sources of um, you know, entertainment or community or connection is um, these days because these are the apps that our kids are using. Um, also, in 2020, 59% of online victim recruitment and active sex trafficking cases occurred on Facebook. So that is the most used app and that is where a lot of the um, sex trafficking and um, exploitation takes place. So how big is the internet? There's gonna be a lot of numbers that come up here on the screen, but I'm not gonna talk about all of them because some of them I can't even say. <laughs> but the big one on here is that the, um, the internet has 4.6 active internet users at any given time, which is sounds like billion, sorry, billion, which is a lot, right? Um, but the world population is 7.87 billion. So that means, that's pretty much half that number, right? So that means, one out of every two people is using the internet regularly, you know, normally, daily. Um, every day, 95 million photos and videos are shared on Instagram. How many of those are appropriate and how many are not, right? So that's, again, kind of a, a scary number. And this is something that a lot of people think that Twitter bans porn because other um, social media sites like Facebook and Instagram, they have policies that talk about you know, pornographic content, um, but actually Twitter does not have that same policy where they're banning it. Um, what they do is they have a, um, you can't post porn in the profile header or the header image or the live feed of Twitter, but it can actually be shared within tweets. Um, and all you have to do in order to share it is change your safety settings on your account and you mark the media um, as containing material that may be sensitive, but this doesn't um, block somebody from actually accessing it. So if a child is using Twitter and they see a tweet that has this um, warning symbol on it that says this is inappropriate or this is sensitive content, all they have to do is click on, do you, do you understand that you're about to see sensitive content or something to that effect? All they have to do is say yes, and it, re it removes that banner and they're able to access it. So it's still, um, it's still a site that makes inappropriate graphic, violent even, um, and then pornographic content okay, um, as long as it's got some sort of sensitive content warning, which is of course a danger to our kids um, as well. So what are our kids doing online? This is a chart that gauges how teens through um, or think that they are perce perceived by other teens. And so the age is at the bottom and then you've got the, per um, the predicted acceptance percentages on the side. And so um, they wanna, that this is kind of showing what they think, how they think their peers view them basically. So as you can see, it bottoms out at the age of 14. Um, this is the age that most kids um, are likely to think that the kids around them do not like them. And then of course, it goes back up a little bit higher towards, you know, as they get older in their teens and young adulthood. Age 14 is also the age limit for having Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. Um, it's also interesting to note, and we'll talk about this more a little bit later, but the uh, national average of age or entrance into sexual exploitation is the age of 14. So this age is really important because this is that preteen, right? This is, this is like that 
it is a teenage age, I guess, but it's more of like a tween coming into those teenage ages. Um, and this is when insecurity is high um, and when um, many boys and girls are, you know, just really trying to figure out who they are and really concerned about what other people think about them. <clears throat> So when it comes to internet access, this is a um, chart from the American Community Survey from 2018, or stats from that, and it says that among 3 to 18 years old, 94% have home internet access. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's through their own computer, but their home has internet access. 88% have access through a computer. Um, 6% had access only through a smartphone. So maybe they don't have home internet access or maybe they don't have a computer, but they do have a smartphone and they can access it that way. Um, only 6% had no internet access at home. So as you can see, the majority of children do have access to the internet. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? We need it for education. There's a lot of reasons to use the internet, but it does go to show um, that it plays a great part in their upbringing, right? By age 11, 53% of kids have their own smartphone. By age 12, 69% of kids have their own smartphone. Now, there's this a gray area, I feel like, for a lot of people. I'm a parent. I have four kiddos. And I think it's really, personally, I believe that this is individual and specific to the parent and the child. Um, and their maturity level and things like that. And it's also speaking to, you know, how their responsibility level, because um, we do live in a day and age where yes, there are social media dangers, but there are also physical dangers. So a lot of times kids have a phone earlier these days due to for, for emergency situations um, and things like that. So this is not to say it's not okay. It's just to say, again, a lot of children have phones younger than they maybe even used to even 10 years ago. When it comes to screen time, this is a, um, these are some statistics from 2019 from Common Sense Media. It says that tw tweens, eight to 12 years old, average four hours and 44 four minutes of screen time a day. Teens average seven hours and 22 minutes a day. And this is not including schoolwork, this is not including, you know, homework or anything like that. So um, this number, it doesn't really surprise me um, because I think a lot of times, and I'm definitely have been guilty of it as a parent, a lot of times we tend to use screens as a babysitter, you know, as parents and caregivers. Um, so the number of hours that they're online has definitely gone up over the years as well. When it comes to online videos, 56% of tweens, eight to 12 years old, watch online videos every single day. 69% of teenagers watch online videos every single day. Now, YouTube is supposed to be um, for ages 13 and up. However, 76% of eight to 12 year, old, year olds say that they actually use the site. So it doesn't mean they have their own site, you know, their own access or their own account. It just means someone in their household is letting them get onto YouTube, probably using mom's account or brother's account or something like that. <clears throat> so they can still access the site even if they're not older than 13. When it comes to monitoring screen time, 15% of tweens and 12% of teens track their own screen time, which in my opinion, that number is actually pretty impressive that they're tra tracking their own screen time. 28% um, of tweens and 14% of teens have parents that track their screen time. And 50% of tweens, 26% of teens have parents that use an app or a program to monitor what they do online. So as you can see, as the kids get older, the, the tracking of screen time, the monitoring of what their children are doing decreases in, in most cases. 
a great app that I just um, found out about that can be used um, by a caregiver or a parent to monitor what uh, your children are doing is called Bark, B-A-R-K, like bark like a dog. Um, and so I recommend checking that out if you're if you're looking for something like that. So information sharing, this is something that um, a lot of kids, especially teenagers, don't really realize the impact um, or even the, um, you know, their digital footprint, right? How anything that's shared online can actually be accessed if their accounts are public and can be saved or stored away by somebody else, even if they think it's going to disappear, like with Snapchat and three to five seconds. It can easily be saved and stored and it's somewhere still. It's not necessarily ever gone, right? And so when it comes to information sharing, it's good to just know what should not be publicly shared. Um, and we share this with our teenagers as well when we uh, present to them in schools and things. So personal information about their family, their friends, feelings, um, even what they're feeling, um, their emotions, that can be, um, something that a predator or a trafficker who's online, you know, who's scouting will can pay attention to. Um, favorite places that, that they go, um, photos, you know, sharing their location. Those are things that are not safe to do. Um, then we've got, you know, location information in terms of places that they hang out, like clubs, activities, churches, youth groups, library, the beaches they go to. Um, if there's a consistent sharing of location information on a public profile through social media, then it's, it's not hard for, you know, someone who's not a good person, like a predator or an exploiter to come in and figure out where this, where this kid likes to hang out and show up there, you know, for the purposes of exploitation. So it's just really, um, it's really not a good thing to be sharing location information. Um, when it comes to identifying information, you know, this is this is, makes sense not to share your whole name or um, your address and phone number and email address, of course, but even something as simple as, your, as hashtags after your name or after your post um, can actually be a way that um, predators can try to uh, link up or connect with the child. For example, um, hashtag I hate my life or hashtag nobody gets me hashtag my parents suck these kinds of things um can really you know make the youth out um to appear you know insecure or vulnerable or weak in an area or going through a, a crisis at home or you know something like that and again this is a way for someone with bad intentions intentions to come in and try to uh, connect with that child and try to be whatever it is they're, they're lacking in their life. And then of course, contact information, that seems obvious, but um, a lot of places like even jobs or um, websites, you know, for clothing or those places will ask for contact information. And if the child isn't hasn't done their research or hasn't asked a trusted adult about it, or, you know, it's just kind of basing it off of, well, this is what they say, this must be who they are, you know, and sharing this information, then of course, if it's not a legitimate business, if it's not a legitimate company or a website, um, that information can fall into the wrong hands and put them and even maybe their family in danger. So it's really important. We, we try to tell uh, the youth that we work with to make sure their profile settings on Instagram, Facebook are set to private and that they're only friending people and following people that they actually know. And then, you know, there's a very real thing called cyberbullying. And this is willful and repeated harm inflicted through the use of computers, cell phones, and other electronic devices. And this is something that um, actually can, can play a part in someone being um, at risk or vulnerable, more vulnerable to exploitation. Um, if they are being cyber bullied, 
you know, teased and mocked in the chat room or, you know, picked on you know, as they're playing a video game or, you know, things like that, right? This is, it's just like physical bullying, except that it's verbal. Um, and it does cause harm. It does cause damage to that child's self-esteem and puts them in a place um, where they are um, lacking confidence or, um, you know, feeling angry even, or um, feeling lonely or, you know, all of those things, depressed, anxious, um, which can open a door for them to accept a friend request or to talk to a stranger that they've never met online, you know, because they're in this place of always being picked on um, or feeling like oh, they're alone in this struggle. And these are some statistics that um, talk about cyberbullying and the impact that it has. So in, um, this is from a the Cyberbullying Research Center, these statistics. And 23.2% of teens have been bullied in the last month, while 4.9% have cyberbullied others in the last month. 55% of cyberbullying victims are between the ages of 14 and 15. And again, there's that age 14 that we discussed earlier, which is that age when a lot of teenagers are already trying to figure it out and trying to um, feel confident in who they are. And that's when like, they're very insecure um, and want other people to like them. So this is um, one of those ages that there is more victimization through cyberbullying happy, happening. 23.7% um, of girls and 21.9% of boys between the ages of 13 and 17 report being cyberbullied, while 35.4% of transgender teens reported being cyberbullied. And so that number um, actually is a little bit larger when it comes to um, teenagers who have a different sexual orientation, you know, and maybe their peers or other people um, are bullying them because of that. And then there's also something called sextortion. And this is a, um, there's actually a film coming out about sextortion. It's called Sextortion, the, um, the Hidden Pandemic, if I remember correctly. Um, but it's by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So um, it was released this month, um, but I haven't had a chance to watch it yet because it hasn't been publicly released, but I highly recommend staying tuned to that. But sextortion um, is a, um, a crime that victimizes someone who has sent some sort of explicit images or videos to somebody else. Um, for example, this is the actual definition. It's a type of blackmail that is used by offenders to acquire additional sexual content from the child, coerce them into engaging in sexual activity, or to obtain money from the child. Um, so for example, there, um, there was a case of sextortion in um, Wyoming, Rock Springs, Wyoming in December of last year, so December of 2021. And what happened is it was a teenage boy and he had accepted a friend request from a girl on Instagram. And the photo was of a girl, specific you know, image of a, of a girl that was close to his age. And they decided to switch over to Snapchat and when they got on Snapchat, she, sh she started sharing explicit photos with him and then asking him for a specific type of new photo in return. He didn't wanna do it at first. And then finally he decided, okay, because she had shared some photos that he would. So he sent one new photo. Um, and what happened was she, sh um, she saved the photo. And then immediately upon receiving it, she demanded $300 from him or she was going, she threatened to share the photo with his friends, with his family, with his school. Um, he was of course anxious and afraid and didn't know what to do. He hadn't told his parents about this you know, online relationship. And so he paid her the $300. Well then once he paid for it, he thought that was the end of it, but it actually wasn't because as we know, blackmail, there's no end to that, right? And so she, then started demanding 500 more dollars. Um, at this point, he was really scared. And so he did tell his parents 
um, and they were able to um, take it to the take the case to the police. But there was not um, they had no way of being able to find this offender, this um, seen possible girl, but probably not a girl um, that was sharing these photos and asking for this money from him. They couldn't track this person down. But there is a way um, if this, you know, sextortion happens to um, to be able to go in many times through the service provider and be able to access and remove the photos. Not in every case, but in many cases that can happen. So this, you know, now this child's life is forever affected by this, um, and you know his his relationship with his parents, right? And so it's a very scary and traumatizing thing for a child to go through this. And there's actually cases um, that where a, a youth has experienced sex torsion, which is like similar to what I did, just explained, and they have suicidal ideation or even commit suicide um, because the photo was shared um, as a form of blackmail with other people in their, in their community and in their circle. So it's a very dangerous and scary thing, um, which is goes back to the oversharing conversation about um, being um, just not sharing images that are explicit, nude or partially nude with anybody else, even over text, um, even if you think the other person can be trusted, even if it's in a consensual relationship, because there's no way to know if that person will or will not use those things against them in the future. And then there's these social media hashtags that um, I found through smartsocial.com. And these, some of these are very surprising. I've not, um, I had not heard of a few of these when I found this list, but these are some dangerous hashtags that kids are using these days to just make, to communicate and to make their status known in certain situations. Hashtag 420 stands for pot or drugs. Um, some of these on here stand have to do with, um, you know, uh, diseases like anorexia and bulimia. And then we've got the hashtag CU46, which is CU for sex. Um, there's one for depression. Again, there's one for eating disorders. And then there's some that have to do with self-harming behavior and suicidal um, tendencies. So the thin spell as well, that just is content that inspires others to be thin. So these are um, really important to know and to even just pay attention to if you're able to, if you are online, aligning your, with your kids and they're online and you guys share accounts or just seeing your children's phones um, because they really can um, open the door to a um, situation with somebody um, by just posting these types of hashtags. Um, making themselves seem um, or making or being maybe being honest about their situation, but you know, others with bad intentions can take these things and really twist them and um, try to relate to the person that's sharing them, um, try to befriend or come in and be a trusted um, confidant or mentor or something like that if they see this um, and put then, of course, then that child will then be at risk. And then we've got some um, emojis that are also used by teenagers through social media. These, some of these are maybe obvious, but some like, um, you know, the electric plug that represents a drug dealer may, may not be so obvious. Um, we've got the, the smiling face with horns, which re represents someone who's in the mood to have a sexual encounter with someone. Um, the Love Hotel, which is, represents a brothel. Um, the woman dancing can represent someone wanting to go party, go, you know, party. And um, even the uh, face with the steam coming from the nose has been reported that drug dealers use this um, to symbolize that they have MDMA. So again, these are hashtags, I'm sorry, these are emojis that represent, you know, dangerous activity, um, dangerous connections, um, and just possibly even dangerous scenarios that are about to take place or have taken place. Um, and there's another page here of other emojis. Some of these are of a sexual nature, um, the eyes. That's one that as a parent, I would pay attention to if I see it, you know, through a text or 
um, through an Instagram conversation or Facebook Messenger conversation with my kiddos because it can represent someone um, sending an explicit picture. You know, the maple leaf can represent drugs. Um, the eggplant or banana can represent male genitals. And the um, circus tent can represent an erection. So as you can see, these are, you know, can represent some pretty inappropriate things. And these are the things that our kids are using. Instead of saying the words, they're texting these things or they're, you know, participating in conversations with these emojis to be able to kind of um, bypass, right, caregivers and parents from possibly knowing what they're talking about. Um, so it's good to be informed and to know what these things stand for as parents and caregivers. So we've touched on a lot of um, different things that have to do with the threats online. So now we're going to tie it together with um, CSEC, which is commercial sexual exploitation of children or sex trafficking. So what does online safety have to do with, with CSEC? So in 2020, the Federal Human Trafficking Report, this is what they said. They said online solicitation has dwarfed other tactics used by traffickers to solicit buyers of commercial sex for over a decade, excuse me, appearing as the primary form of solicitation in over twice as many criminal cases as any other method each year since 2008. So online solicitation is the main way that traffickers are um, selling children and um, soliciting for commercial sex. So it's really important to know that it's not just um, happening sometimes, but it's happening the majority of the time, that online solicitation. In 2019 to 2020. So this is a graph of um, from the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children. These are um, reports that were made to the um, uh, cyber tip line showing the impact of COVID when it comes to online enticement reports. Um, so in 2019, there were reports made to this tip line that were 19,174, which is still a large number, but COVID hits, 2020 happens, more people are staying at home, that number goes up to 37,872 in one year. Um, so these are reports of adults seeking enticements with children. And again, this is just what's been reported. So this doesn't even accurately represent probably the grand scheme of things, right? And then in the middle, um, this is the number of reports that were made by the public um, of child sexual abuse material online between 2019 and 2020. Again, you see there was a jump, you know, from 150,000 to 303,000 in that one year due to people staying at home and people being online even more often than they were prior to the pandemic. Um, in 2020, there were 21.7 million reports of suspected child sexual exploitation made to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's Cyber Tip Line. That's, this was the highest number of reports they ever received in one year, so 21.7 million. But of those 21.7 million reports, 21.4 million were from electronic service providers. So the vast majority of these reports came from the internet, came from social media, came from online recruitment and solicitation. So here are some facts from the Internet Watch Foundation. They reported its worst year on record for child sexual abuse material online in 2021. There were 252,000 URLs containing images of, or videos of children being sexually abused compared with 153,000 from the previous year. In 2021, there were 182,000 instances of self-generated material. Um, and what that means is 
that it was self generated material is when the child is um, putting the material up themselves, putting the content up themselves. And there is no um, obvious abuse going on from an adult in the content. It doesn't mean that there's not exploitation happening. It just means there's no adult abusing a child present in the, the material. Um, of those 182,000 instances, 27,000 were actually seven to 10 year olds, which is more than triple the number for 2020. So basically the number just keeps getting up, going higher, getting worse. Um, and the biggest age group for those self-generated sexual abuse material um, is 11 to 13 years old. So that preteen age, right, right there again, right, right there before 14 is really um, the age that seems to be the most vulnerable to um, this, this type of exploitation. And it doesn't, it doesn't, it can be, you know, again, exploitation can look like somebody on the other side of the screen through messenger or through Instagram asking or telling or blackmailing, right, the child to, to self-generate some, you know, inappropriate nude or explicit images or videos and then send. So again, it's, it's exploitation. So this is the definition of sex trafficking according to the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. And it is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, transportation provision, obtaining, patronizing or soliciting of a person for the purpose of a commercial sex act in which the commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such act has not attained 18 years of age. Commercial sexual exploitation of children or CSEC can be used interchangeably with the sex trafficking definition, um, but it's specific to children in that it's a range of crimes and activities involving the sexual abuse or exploitation of a child for the financial benefit of any person or in exchange for anything of value given or received by any person. So to break it down, it's a commercial sex act. So that is a sex act plus anything of value. And a sex act is the, the whole range right, of things. Um, everything from traditional sexual activity to live camming, stripping, escort services, um, even the exchange of intimate apparel, um, sending and receiving um, explicit photos and videos. This is all considered a sex act. Um, and then anything of value, again, is relative to the person. It could be um, cash, but could also be um, to a homeless youth. It could be a couch to sleep on. It could be a McDonald's Happy Meal. Um, it could be a phone. So that part is relative to the individual and to their specific situation. But when you combine those two things, you get a commercial sex act. What, what makes it trafficking is when there's a minor involved or there's force, fraud, or coercion. If there's a minor involved, force, fraud, or coercion does not have to be proved. Um, they are immediately considered, in the eyes of the law, they are considered a victim if they are under 18 years of age. If they're an adult, then an element of force, fraud, or coercion needs to be proven for it to be considered sex trafficking. And there are many players in the um, sex trafficking market um, that also include the recruiting process, the harboring of, you know, providing a place to stay, the transportation, the soliciting, um, the one who is profiting, right? Um, you know, even like Uber services or taxi drivers or hotel business industry. Um, these are all places that can um, play a part in a trafficking scenario as well. So there's something called grooming. And this is um, when a trafficker comes in and tries to um, prepare the youth for exploitation. So they'll try to build a relationship. Um, many times it's based on a common interest. It'll start off slow. It, won't, it will not be obvious. It, it may look like um, a friendship or a romantic relationship. Um, it could be just somebody coming in offering money um, or a job opportunity. But once they've established trust, then they're going to isolate the young person and they're going to monopolize their time. They're going to make their parents, their support system, their community out to be the bad guys. Um, and they're going to put doubt in their head about their um, about their support system. Even they're going to make them basically distrust everyone um, except 
them. And then they're going to learn all about this young person. It's going to seem really exciting to the youth at first because it's going to look like this, um, this other person, this adult, um, is very interested in their life. They're going to learn their values, their secrets, their dreams, their hopes, you know, the things that they're lacking even um, and where they're vulnerable about their family. Um, because at some point down the line, after the grooming stage, um, they will use those things against the child. So an example of a grooming scenario um, looks like this. So there's a 15 year old and um, he's developing a serious relationship with someone online through a video game chat. Um, they start talking, this, this boy starts talking about this relationship with other people as if it's, you know, real, like a real tangible relationship. Um, and, it's, and it, as if it's a, an important part of his life, but they've never actually met. They don't know each other apart from this video game chat. Um, but this is, you know, a suspicious situation because eventually down the line, what could happen is this, this person that he's been chatting with online and forming, you know, this foundation of a relationship with through this video game could end up being a scenario where this, um, this, this adult wants to meet him in person. Um, maybe he offers up the idea of, Hey, I've got more video games like this at my house. Um, and I know you said that your mom doesn't like you really playing these violent games. I have all of them. So why don't we meet up? You can come over, you know, we'll have lunch and we'll play video games at my place. It could just look like that, you know, very, very simple and, and not shady sounding at all to the teenage boy. Another um, possible grooming scenario through social media or online access is, let's say there's your 10 year old child or your sister or sibling is, um, loves TikTok. And even though she's not of age to be on TikTok, she uses her sister's account. Um, she uploads videos on TikTok of herself dancing to pop songs. It's innocent, nothing inappropriate about it. She's just having fun. Um, but there's always a viewer who gets on and compliments her, her dance moves in the comments. Um, and then he asks her if he can DM her with dance related questions. This is, you know, interesting because and obviously suspicious, but the child may not recognize it as suspicious. And what could happen is if she accepts, you know, messages from this person because he's saying, or she's saying it's about her dancing and they want to learn where she, how she knows how to do that and where she learned that, you know, it could turn into, man, you're dancing so awesome. Could you send me a video of you dancing to this song, but could you do it without any clothes on? It could just look like that. Again, it's not, um, it's not difficult for predators to, um, to present these types of scenarios. And um, we have to uh, be just be aware, right? That they're out there and help protect our kids by making sure they're aware as well, right? So what can we do? These are different stages of development as um, children, you know, as they're growing, obviously um, during the early stages of life, there needs to be consistent, predictable, and reliable um, care so that they learn to trust themselves and trust others. Um, during the second stage there, where like their toddler years, they're learning um, you know, how to be a little bit more independent. They're learning what shame is and what fear is. And so they need to be encouraged and supported, right? To increase that kind of confidence and that in independence. As they're getting older, um, three to five years, that's like when they really want to um, start playing and there's more games happening. There's um, a lot of questions. That's when they're super curious. So not shutting them down, but being open as a caregiver to answering those questions, making them feel secure and that they have a safe place to ask those questions and that they, um, you know, safely interact with you and play games with you in a healthy way. This is all really um, provides a great stable environment for the child as they grow. When they get to those tween years, um, this is when, um, they're feeling maybe more competent and more confident in their ability to achieve their goals. If they've been, you know, reinforced at home that they are, um, you know, that they are capable of going after their dreams or capable of, you know, doing, you know, a plus B equals C or whatever that looks like their, their goals are, are being, um, championed in the house and encouraged, right. Then they're going to feel supportive, um, supported. And as they get to those teen years, 
this is when really they, um, a lot of teams struggle with their identity or they're learning who they are, right? And um, they are wanting to explore and to do new things. So having a strong sense of self is really important for a, perfect, a protective factor, um, feeling like they can be independent and relate to others well and form genuine relationships because at home, um, it's been encouraged in, in their home or in their um family environment that they are able to explore safely and freely within, you know, um, well-defined boundaries and limits, um, and that their independence has been reinforced. Um, and so they feel able to be, um, who they are and to be confident in their, in their identity as they get into, into those older teen years. So it's really important for us as adults to, understand that this is a conversation about online safety and the dangers of the internet. It's not supposed to be scary. I mean, it is informative and it's knowledgeable and it, it is scary, but it's not meant to bring fear so much as it's meant to bring awareness so that um, we can then inform our kids, right? And help them. So talking to our kids about online safety has to happen quite often. It's not just a one-time conversation. Um, it's an ongoing conversation and it should start early um, with healthy boundaries, talking about things like good touch, bad touch, um, talking about what a safe adult looks like and what an unsafe person looks like, um, being engaged in their life and, um, letting them know that no questions are off limits, that we're not going to judge them. If they have a question about something, even if we don't understand it, um, letting them show us even, you know, letting them teach us, for example, sometimes I don't know what um, certain things mean on social media or, you know, a texting um, hashtag or, you know, different words that are really popular, like acronyms that are popular now with, with teenagers. So I'll, I'll ask my kids, Hey, what does FOMO mean? You know, or something like that. And they may laugh at me. They do, <laughs> but they also will tell me um, because I'm curious. I just want to know what, the, what, you know, and be involved and be a part of the conversation um, so that they know they can, they can talk to me. And I'm just trying to be that cool mom to them. But really for me, I'm trying to be informed and be an active part of, of that part of their lives. Um, you know, un understanding that online games and social media, it's not all bad and it's, it's okay to, for them to be on it. Um, so they need connection. We all need connection. And that's just another way for connection. Um, so not shaming every part of, of media, right. Just again, being informed, um, but know enough that if they do have questions about something, um, being able to answer them, or if you don't know the answer, finding someone who does or doing the research to find it. Make sure there's rules and expectations for technology usage in the house. This is not easy to do, especially with growing teenagers, um, but it is important um, for their own safety. And then of course, fostering their self-esteem and modeling safe and appropriate internet usage. I know that it can be, you know, kind of one of those things um, as a parent, do as I say, not as I do, right? Being on our phones or our devices quite often as a parent, um, but then, expecting them, you know, to not be on devices, right? As all the time. Well, if we're not modeling that for them, why do they, why, why should they do that? So just being that, um, consistent and, um, being, um, true to what we're saying, not for them to follow these, these particular guidelines, guidelines, and then for us to also follow them as well. Um, and then just showing them that it's not just about what they look like, that who they are um, holistically is what's really important and they're valuable, period, right? It's not about how many likes they get. It's not about who comments on their photos. It's not about even, you know, if their makeup looks right that day or if they've got the cool outfit or, you know, it's, it's never about that. It's always about who they are on the inside and they are, you know, a human being and they're valuable and they're your child or they're your niece or they're your cousin. They're valuable, period. And there's more to them than just um, those, those outside attributes. Um, so that they're not looking necessarily to be, um, to be valued solely based on the outside. And then we tell teens, of course, to set their social media accounts to private, to be cautious when providing information, like I mentioned earlier, um, just to be, to be aware of the things that they share through pictures and videos of themselves online or with, or with their friends even, um, and to post pictures of themselves that represent themselves 
the whole, their whole selves in a way that makes them happy. It's not for somebody else to approve of them or for popularity or for status, but it's, um, it's, it represents who they are and it brings them joy. Those are the things that they should be posting and to even ask themselves the question, you know, is this something I would feel comfortable talking about face-to-face -face with somebody or, um, dressing like face-to-face -face with somebody versus if I posted this picture, is this the same me in real life as it is online, right? Are we the same? Um, because if not, why not? You know, what is, what is the motive there? What's the intent there? Um, then of course, verify businesses and job offers and people that you encounter um, with a safe, trusted adult, do your research. Um, and then of course, talk to their friends. Um, we encourage them to talk to their friends about online safety as well. And this is just a quick, we've got just a few minutes left. I'm just gonna show this really fast. It's like two minutes long, I think. Those are just great conversation starters that we like to tell caregivers and parents to talk to maybe start the conversation with their kiddos um, on this topic. And then lastly, I'm done. I just wanted to leave this um, slide up here. These are some resources you can check out. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has a great um, interactive animated series on YouTube called um, Into the Cloud, and it's for ages 10 and younger, and it talks about, um, gives tips and tricks on how to stay safe online. So I highly represent, um, I highly um, encourage you checking that website out as well. Um, and that's it. These are some of the great places to check out. And thank you so much for attending the presentation today. Thank you so much, Harmony. That was a lot of great information, especially, you know, the hashtag and the emojis. I knew some of them, but not all of them. And it's just really eye opening on how, you know, all of that has evolved, um, especially, you know, the Bark app, which I'll send the link in our follow up email after this. Um, so if you guys are interested in learning more about that, um, I'll have that link up there um, in that email. And just, you know, kind of talking about, you know, good touch, bad touch. Um, for example, this morning, uh, my kids are still in the early childhood. Um, they have this book. Um, it's like the David series. Um, there's one where it says, um, keep your hands to yourself. So she was saying, you know, it's not good to touch anybody. I'm like, no, it's okay. But, you know, make sure it's good touch, bad touch. Like if you want to hold hands, um, if you're not comfortable or if the person you want to hold hands with isn't comfortable, just making sure that, you know, you're aware of that consent kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really great. Um, oh, I, I don't see if we have any questions um, yet, but um, I also wanted to take the time to share a little bit about our clinic too. Um, 
So again, just to remind you, our clinic is a mental health clinic for post 9-11 veterans, service members um, of uh, in all branches to include the guard and reserves um, and anybody that they consider a family member. We have our contact information up here if you have any um, questions or if you would like to um, explore the services that we offer. We offer individual for child and adult, um, child ages five up. We offer um, couples counseling, family counseling, and also group counseling. And we also have great uh, monthly events such as the one Harmony just did today. Um, so if you have any questions, um, feel free to email me. Um, or if you have any other questions that you wanted to follow up with um, to Harmony, um, I'll also include her contact information in our follow-up email after. Um, is there any questions from anybody in the audience? Um, love the app list. Yep. Um, I'll, um, I just wanted to know yeah. if we could get a copy of those slides. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot I was muted. Um, so I can definitely send, there are some slides that are for internal use only that I'm not allowed per our organization's you know, policy to send out, but I can definitely send um, the ones like with the hashtags and the emojis um, and things like that for sure. Yeah, so I'll wait um, for the oh, sorry. Um, slides. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so I do work with parents. Uh, we provide parenting classes. And I was wondering about presenting. Um, would you be able to like present to our parents? Sure, absolutely. We we have a couple of different. Would you want it to be online safety as well? or? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, That's definitely. A lot, a lot of good information. For sure, definitely. She'll, um, Anissa will include my email Perfect. and then you can definitely just contact me through my email. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, and I'll be sending that out once I get the um, slides that um, a lot of the people have requested and so that I'll attach that in that email as well. Well, thank you so much everybody um, for joining us today. Um, thank you again, Harmony, for everything. That was such a great presentation. Um, I'll see you guys at our next event.